today's meeting. Good afternoon from Washington, D.C., and welcome to today's meeting of the National Shipper Advisory Committee. My name is Dylan Richmond, and I serve as the federal designated federal officer for the committee. Before beginning today's meeting, we have a few announcements for attendees. Please keep cameras and microphones turned off for the duration of the meeting, unless you are a committee member. Today's agenda will focus on the committee members and updates they would like to share. In accordance with Federal Advisory Committee Act guidelines, the agency will produce minutes of this meeting that are certified by the NSAC chair within 90 days. These minutes will be posted on our website once certified. A recording of this meeting will also be kept on our website and should be posted in the next few days. Also, the committee welcomes written public comments. The process for submitting comments is outlined in the Federal Register Notice for this meeting. For committee members, as an FYI, general antitrust prohibitions still apply to you all. We would advise that members do not discuss specifics on prices or rates, um, methods by which prices or rates are measured, market allocations, coordination of contracts, profit levels, or and a boycott or refusal to deal with shippers or carriers. So with that, those disclosures out there, um, I'll go, quickly go over the agenda. Today, the committee would like to hear updates from the two subcommittees that were established at its December meetings. One subgroup focuses on data sharing and visibility, while the other focuses on fees and surcharges, including detention and demurrage. There is a quorum of committee members in attendance today. So at this point, I will turn it over to the NSAC chair, Brian Bumpus, to lead the meeting. Thanks, Dylan. Thanks, Dylan. Um, thank you for, uh, uh, to all my committee members for making time to be uh, on the call today. And uh, thank you to members of the public as well for uh, covering out some time to, uh, to join us as well. Um, I also saw um, our, our newest um, confirmed FMC commissioner, Mr. Max Vekic, um, on the call as well. So welcome to the commission, sir, and uh, happy to have you here. Uh, congratulations on your appointment and confirmation as well. Um, as Dylan briefly uh, introduced, we will hear updates today from the two chairs of our two subcommittees. Um, I think first in the docket will be our, our um, data standardization and visibility subcommittee uh, chaired by Mr. Gabriel Rodriguez of A Customs Brokerage in Miami. Um, and then uh, subsequent to that, we'll hear updates from our um, demerge, detention and freight charges subcommittee um, chaired by Mr. Rich Roach of Mohawk Global Logistics up in Syracuse, New York. Um, we'll uh, try to be as uh, succinct with our agenda today as possible and uh, might even be uh, concluded a little bit before the two hour mark. Um, certainly, we'll leave some time at the end for questions from the public as well. Um, as we're now getting into kind of the, the nit and gritty of what this committee uh, was founded to do. Uh, with that, uh, I'll turn it over to Mr. Mike Simonanis, my vice chair, for opening comments as well. Good afternoon. I think building upon what Brian said, um, I want to uh, express appreciation to the S&P Global IHS market team to allow the committee members who were in attendance at the Trans-Pacific Maritime Conference last week to participate in a town hall Tuesday afternoon to really kind of create greater awareness on the committee's mission and focus um, in our work supporting the commission. And I think reinforcing what Dylan said already today, you know, for the broader shipper and stakeholder community who is participating today, and for all of you who are going to review the written comments and the, the development of policy recommendations that we're working on, I want to reinforce how important it is to hear from you as we develop policy recommendations. We want to make sure that we're, we're looking at it as holistically as possible um, from a national perspective, from an import and export perspective. And while the focus of the committee and the subcommittee is into the details of this stuff, uh, and guidance and, and review by the public is essential. And so we want to make sure that we continue to reinforce that message in each public meeting that we have. And now I'll turn it over to uh, Gabriel to let him go through the data sharing and uh, visibility subcommittee work so far. Thank you, Mike and uh, Brian and all those present today. Um, so our subcommittee uh, officially organized in uh, in the beginning of December. Uh, we had an initial meeting uh, just at, the, at uh, January just to kind of organize a little bit and get our uh, thoughts together on 
how we wanted to discuss the, the efforts moving forward. Um, we, we then uh, established three meetings and our meetings were more exploratory in nature uh, to begin with. Uh, January, uh, February 4th, uh, we met with uh, LA Long Beach's Port Optimizer, uh, received a presentation from, from their product and uh, how they uh, provide for the different capabilities to, to uh, provide for visibility and what kind of data points they are gathering and sharing um we're looking at the the possibility of adopting some of those uh capabilities looking at the potential to scale that nationally and looking for additional opportunities there um you know just to pitch in uh, on our recommendations february 18th we met with uh, dcsa which is the uh, digital container shipping organization uh they're working on a gro global industry uh, dig digitalization standard um for you know, ad adopting common technology that enables uh, collaboration globally, um, and so that aligns with uh, with the information that we're trying to gather. And then uh, just yesterday, March 9th, we met with Steptoe. Uh, they are developing or looking at developing a national supply chain data portal, uh, basically a platform to encompass most modes of transport uh, to align industry terminology and technical details uh, for the global supply chain network. Um, so we, we, what we have noticed in our, in our initial meetings is that there are various initiatives going on. Um, we know the DOT also has uh, some initiatives going on. There may be some info coming out from the White House shortly um, and uh, Commissioner Bensel's uh, own uh, data initiative that he is uh, conducting on a, on a weekly basis. Um, and so we're, we're trying to gather all that information. That's been mainly the focus of our first meetings. Um, we had not elected a chair until this past week, and I think uh, everybody kind of stepped back. I stepped forward, and so I'm now chairing this uh, subcommittee, um, but it's a good group of people. We anticipate uh, you know, our, our, our next meetings to now take some of this uh, information gathering that we've done and, and, and start to really uh, focus on, on putting together uh, those suggestions and, and, and commentary on what needs to do you know what needs to be done moving forward uh individually again we've you know we've, we've taken some looks at, at all the different initiatives that are out there um and trying to bring that information to our discussion uh, to see how we can align um you know what's going on we we've kind of already determined that we are not looking for that particular unicorn solution out there uh rather the fact that there has to be a solution and trying to to, to bring together um some of the data and information that that we feel is a necessary uh, that, that must be included on this. Um, so again, you know, as we develop a, a, a recommendation moving forward or recommendations moving forward, um, we've established a few points that we know that we want to make sure that we, we move forward on. Um, first of them is, is just being able to reinforce the FMC's authority um, within their own mission statement. You know, they, they have uh, established uh, to ensure a competitive and reliable international ocean transport system. Uh, that guards against unfair and defect, uh, deceptive practices. So we want to see how we can reinforce that, uh, reinforce uh, that uh, there's no, you know, substantial increases in transportation costs or decreases in services uh, that, that causes, you know, substantial harm. That's part of their mission statement. It's kind of what's going on right now. We want to figure out how with data we can help uh, to, to support that. Um, and then taking actions to, to, to address any unfavorable conditions by, either uh, you know, foreign governments or business practices in, in the US uh, shipping trade lanes. Um, also within that, we are looking at uh, building out a, a roadmap of uh, legislative committees and staff uh, that we can uh, liaise with if, if necessary to support um, you know, this, this uh, collaborative uh, initiative that we're trying to, to launch. One of the other opportunities and, and, and taking from uh, some of the suggestions that have been put out there already is uh, the opportunity to perhaps create either a national port authority or a national supply chain strategy that would uh, you know, tackle uh, the, the, the current supply chain crisis for now and for the future um, you know, so that we can assure that we've got uh, operational visibility you know, within the entire supply chain. So that would encompass you know, aligning data uh, standards, uh, ensuring the data has integrity and meeting certain, you know, certain minimum requirements. Uh, additional to that, making sure that all the players that are involved, um, that we can under US law, 
you know, uh, adhere to this, uh, ensure that they're properly represented within uh, these standards, specifically the data elements. Um, so essentially, that's that's uh, you know the high level summary of what uh, what we've done so far. Um, again, anticipating our next meetings will be to kind of uh, grab all of this data information and start to uh, uh, strategize on how we can provide actionable recommendations to the to the commissioners. So with that, uh, I'll, I'll I'll open back up and and actually uh, pitch back to uh, some of our committee if anybody wants to add to that or provide any additional information. I think you did a great job um, explaining where we are and and how we got there. I you know similarly agree that I think a, a few of us have said that we want to. Um, put forth the need of the business community in terms of visibility more so um, and needed to see what was out there and the, the potentially conflicting priorities that are going on with the different projects so that um, we can put forth a solid recommendation to the committee. Thank you for outlining that, Gabriel, and thank you for sharing. Sure. Yeah, I'll just jump in as well. I completely agree, Gabriel. Really great job. Thank you for representing. I think we've learned a lot over the last few weeks here as we um, did some exploratory sessions. And I think we've got a really great framework now to identify what are the data needs that you know meet all of the industry standard, standards, whether it's import, export, um, and making sure that we can uh, make some really good recommendations uh, to the FMC on what that should look like. And then um, continue to learn and evolve of um, how we actually then start to do that with the different options and tools out there. So thank you. Gabriel, how has your team um, sort of prioritized, um, you know, current gaps in data visibility and or standardization of lexicon and terminology? And how have you prioritized that in your committee's um, path forward um, in relation to you know additional interviews or conference calls that you'll have with outside parties, um, all obviously with the focus of creating recommendations for the commission. Yeah, I think I think you know our initial exploratory meetings were just that uh, Brian trying to gather all of the data that's out there. Um, I think a little bit of our analysis now will be in our in our next meeting to kind of kind of come up with those gaps. Um, see what particular information is missing from what all these different initiatives are, are addressing. And then from there, be able to, to tackle a, a specific, you know, recommendation or set of recommendations that we can provide. Um, so it's been, it's been at the core of what we're, what we're trying to figure out is, you know, as, as Jen mentioned, there's overlapping initiatives here and, uh, and we want to just gather that data. And it's, instead of looking for that specific solution, try to ensure that the data that's necessary is included in a recommendation that we provide over to the to the commission rather than trying to tell them look you know use this product or that product or create this you know program or platform just ensure that we're providing you know these data points are what's necessary for import export uh and you know through through transportations you know inland into the us uh as much as you know we can we can tackle that under the authority of the fmc ensure that all that is addressed uh, so it's it not necessarily been developed yet but that it has been at the core of what we're looking at Cool. Uh, Dylan Gabriel made reference to trying to gain information from, or, or let's say about um, other groups that are concurrently working on related projects or initiatives to what the subcommittee is doing. Uh, do we anticipate any obstacles in getting some clarity on what those groups are doing? Yeah, that's something to needs to be looked into, but that will be, I will follow up on that later on, but yeah. Okay. Uh, Brian, I was just going to say inside that I think, yeah, it, that's going to be important in the broader ongoing work that we've got. I think we, to the right. points made by the subcommittee members, we've gotten some insight into some of the work that's going on, but not a complete understanding of, you know, all the various industry organizations that have been participating, have done their work, and are really looking to figure out how to, you know, where do we have alignment on goals and objectives, to Jen's point, um, within this, right? I like the, the the national supply chain data portals kind of focus on three key areas. You know, the framework itself of how data and data elements can are shared within the physical supply chain. You know, ultimately then getting the standards that the industry can agree to across the various uh, components of the 
and physical movement and not pushing data burdens uh, from one sector to another, but we're really looking for the national alignment. And then ultimately, how does it all interact with one another, right? Because you've got many different uh, individual entities and industry verticals that have made technology investment. And again, to the points made, we're looking for the, the how and what um, and not the technology solution and open system is what's been proposed, how that works together and being mindful of proprietary and security issues for any organization's data within this framework um, is important. So I think reinforcing what Brian's asked is we've, we still need more guidance on what's coming on. So those participating who, again, watch this later, if you're in one of these uh, initiatives not, not mentioned, um, providing that feedback directly into um, the link so that the subcommittee's got access to it and can widen out our perspective and understanding is be helpful. We don't want to be duplicative. We want to build off of what others are doing in an aligned way, also bringing into account, you know, what all the committee members are involved with. So we want to just make sure that we are aligned and being respectful of people's time and energy as we continue to move forward through this. Well, and there's a desire not only to, to, to not be duplicative, but also to not be contrary. Uh, or conflicting in the recommendations that are being put forth um, as well. That would certainly muddy the waters and um, I think delay the the implementation of any beneficial recommendation that comes out of any of these groups, ours or, or others. So, um, uh, Brian, as you witnessed, I was, I was chatting with uh, Chairman Maffei last week and I made the suggestion that the chair and the vice chair of this committee um, uh, try to meet with the various committees in, let's say, the DOT and DOC that have their own uh, committees looking at, at, at uh, shipping issues um, to try and get these silos to talk to each other to make sure we are working in a collaborative or in, a, in the same direction. So my question is this, as, as this committee, can we suggest as the committee to the chairman to do this very thing and reach out to these committees and try and get a chair slash vice chair meeting of all of these committees to have a collaborative effort. I, I would be in favor of that, Steve. Um, unfortunately, I'm not really uh, at the helm of making that happen as we're still a little bit unsure of who those groups are. Um, certainly, it's something that's been raised. Um, subsequent to the conversation that you have with Chairman Maffei, um, Mike and I have had similar conversations as well. So it's something that we're, we're encouraging, but um, you know, we're kind of in a wait and see holding pattern right now until it actually happens, Steve. Yeah, I, I'm just saying as this committee, as we can make a suggestion to the chairman. Agreed. Mike, any comments on that? Fully supportive of it. So if we need to do parliamentary prayer, I'll give you the second on that, Steve. <laughs> right. There you go. Any other comments or questions from any of the committee members um, to Gabriel or any of the other members of the data subcommittee? Yeah, Gabriel, uh, Rick DeMeo, nice job uh, updating and appreciate the work. I, lo I love this initiative. Um, did, it, did you get a sense for whether or not there's going to be opportunities for sort of quick wins? and things that uh, we could standardize and move quickly on that seem obvious, um, given that we're starting from pretty much ground zero on this topic. I think Mike just mentioned it now, this uh, particular national data portal, um, you know, seems like an interesting uh, concept, but uh, not, not to support one over the other. Um, I, I think there's enough impetus from, from many different parties involved and, and going all the way up to the White House um, that we could hopefully see something move quickly. The one date that was kind of thrown out in, in one of the conversations was hopefully there's a working model by the end of this year. Um, and uh, so, so that's time-wise, hopefully that's, uh, that, that's something that will come to fruition, if not earlier. But uh, I, I, one of my cautions or one of my concerns is that we, you know, we, we beat this into the ground and, and you know, uh, not, not we as a committee or, or, or we the FMC, um, but just the overall concepts uh, nationwide just get, continued to be reviewed and reviewed and reviewed and reviewed until, you know, we beat it into the ground and not really come up with a solution. So hopefully um, one or another will, will pop up and, and, and take a lead on this and uh, hopefully it'll get support from, from all the different initiatives that are going on right now. Great. Thanks. Okay. Um, 
Any questions from uh, any members of the public that are on this call that are not members of the National Ship Advisory Committee um, as it relates to the data subcommittee and the work that you're doing? You're letting me get off easy, Gabriel. And with that, I'll turn it back over to you. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, all right, the next uh, item on the agenda is our second subcommittee. This is our Demers Detention and Freight Charges Subcommittee that's chaired by Mr. Rich Roach. Um, Rich, um, take it away, buddy. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have had two meetings as subcommittee. Uh, the first was held on February 17th. Uh, first order of business was uh, to twist my arm into becoming chair, so I accepted. Um, and uh, then we went on to, to do some discussion. Uh, there's some, some uh, parallel interests going on at the same time. We have the ANPRM that's uh, released by the Federal Maritime Commission with uh, uh, initial due date right now of March 17th. Uh, so we talked about that and the fact that we would want to potentially align ourselves with the, the mission of the ANPRM as we move forward with some of our recommendations, either in process along with that uh, as formal comments from the committee uh, or as, as separate recommendations. So uh, we had some significant uh, discussion then on rail storage, um, and it goes to the jurisdiction uh, issue between Surface Transportation Board, who uh, flatly uh, says they do not have jurisdiction, and then the FMC potential jurisdiction uh, based on the through bill of lading uh, all the way through final delivery at the railhead. Um, so I, I, I guess uh, that has spurred on quite a bit of discussion within our group. Uh, which we continued then um, at, this, at the next meeting. We'll get into that in a second. Um, the second topic that we uh, took on was that of the uh, port and terminal announced dwell fees. Uh, that conversation uh, continued and, and actually expanded into other kinds of demerge and detention fees and, and uh, issues. And so we started to uh, uh, put that down as a separate topic uh, we may end up having to divide that into even more multiple topics, but uh, suffice to say, we left that as the second issue uh, for us to come back uh, to in the next meeting. And the last subject that we tackled in February was the uh, subject of merchant, which is a, a, a term that appears in the terms and conditions on the back of the bills of lading. And, uh, sort of a catch-all phrase that uh, anybody really associated with the transport uh, might be labeled as merchant by the carrier and might be end up holding the bag for any liability on, on charges. And so we're developing that as a, a third topic uh, going into our second meeting. Um, each uh, of those three topics, uh, the rail storage, the dwell fees, and the merchant uh, were each assigned to uh, uh, one person to come up with some verbiage and, uh, and then uh, bring it back to the group, which we discussed at the, the next meeting. So I'll go to the, the, fifth, the March 7th meeting this week that we held was the follow-up to that. <clears throat> we uh, have some verbiage that we're circulating in terms of a actual formalized, um, or what we're trying to formalize as a recommendation for the FMC on rail um, jurisdiction, uh, where we would be recommending that the FMC come out with a a statement of uh, their jurisdiction over anything that's moving on a through bill to an inland destination. Uh, roughly, uh, it's more, more than that that we have in the actual recommendation, but that's the, the rough um, draft of that, which is being circulated amongst the greater committee for any comments, at, at which point we formalize that and bring it back to a vote of the full committee uh, to see if we go forward with that as a recommendation. <coughs> The next topic was the dwell fees, and that got into uh, a few different types of, of fees. So port and terminal dwell is, is one issue. Um, we may have to break that out as a, a separate recommendation. It, it comes from separate origin um, from the, the potentially the, uh, the ports and the Picari meeting with the Biden administration that started the LA Long Beach port fees. And then the uh, specific terminal fees that uh, some of the terminals that have announced similar type of an, an issue. Uh, so I think we'll, we'll be looking at, uh, at putting that out as, as its own uh, issue for recommendation. 
but while we were doing that, we explored some other topics. Uh, one was government hold. So we've had a, a lot of discussion around government hold. Um, another is uh, actually looking at the language uh, regarding the, the description of fees. And uh, this is something that is in concert with the interpretive rule uh, where uh, there's multiple terms that are used to mean the same thing. And there's uh, some, some words that are used to mean different things, but they're the same word. And so we have uh, an issue of maybe defining um, how these are, are uh, defined within the context and the meaning, uh, what uh, trigger points start and stop these. And so we're, we're looking at uh, defining that a little bit better as a recommendation. <clears throat> That's kind of going along with the triggers uh, of, that uh, are set within the interpretive rule. And then the last part that we looked at on that was uh, early return date as its own issue. Uh, it's certainly there's there's a, a complex uh, issue with the frequently changing vessel schedules that cause a change in early return date. Um, some cargo starts moving many days in advance of its initially issued return date, uh, only to find out that uh, when it's loaded and it starts to come back, it can't get rail build and, and uh, it has to be held off site until the, the sliding schedules uh, that are causing these return shifts uh, come in line. And that could be many days. Sometimes it, it turns into fees on terminal for early delivery. Um, and uh, so there's there's a lot there that uh, we want to uh, really vet and, and define and then come up with a, a recommendation. So that summarizes the different parts of the, uh, the, the dwell fee and, and detention pieces that we're looking at specifically. And then the last one that we um, had uh, some serious dialogue on is the merchant clause. Uh, and so we are trying to put our arms around that. It's going to require some more discussion and, and uh, really coming to a more succinct uh, way of describing the issue and, and what our recommendation would be. But uh, the merchant clause has the ability to be abused. Uh, we have many examples that we've cited uh, that uh, show where somebody that really isn't a part of the financial part of the transaction gets left holding the bag for fees that are due and it's done in an unfair way. So if there's a way that we can further um, stipulate that uh, really the parties to the contract of carriage are the ones that should be held uh, instead of uh, ancillary type uh, uh, companies that are just performing other services and end up holding the bag. So that was the, uh, the other um, piece that we got into uh, in our, in our, meeting this week. Uh, and lastly, uh, we, we ended with discussion that's related to the rail jurisdiction uh, issue, uh, although jurisdiction being its own issue, um, the, the issue of box rules at the IPI points uh, is something that we may want to look at as a separate committee. Uh, there's enough there that potentially uh, we could form around that. Um, it's, uh, it's more to me a, a behavior uh, then a cost, the cost goes away if the behavior goes away. Uh, but box rules is something that we may want to take on. Um, so we're advising from the uh, Demergent Detention Subcommittee to maybe kick that out to the general committee as a, a new subcommittee uh, for, for analyzing the box rules. Uh, we also then further discuss the ANPRM. Uh, and th there's a potential that the commentary period would be uh, shifted uh, for another 30 days. So right now it's March 17th or the, is the due date. We're waiting to hear from the FMC if there's going to be an extension on that. As a group, we don't have to uh, potentially make any response on it yet. And, uh, and there's uh, you know, sort of a, another bite at the apple when it comes around for an, uh, an NPRM for the final rulemaking. Uh, but I think that uh, if we have the opportunity to weigh in on it, that uh, we may be doing that. It involves a lot of detention and emerge questions. So that's where we stand with that. I would uh, defer to the rest of my fellow committee members to have any other comments or uh, ideas that they want to bring forward at this time. Thanks. Yeah, Rich, if I may, just one thing, and, and maybe I missed it if you said it. Um, one of the kind of the foundations for our group is everything that we're working on is ways to incentivize cargo movement in and out of the terminals. So we're kind of starting from that premise and then everything else that we discuss and formulate will be based on that. Sure, 
I, I think that it's it's always important to say that uh, you know we support the whole concept of demerge and detention. Uh, demerge as a way to incentivize the rapid pickup of import loads and and detention in a way to incentivize the rapid return of carriers' equipment. Uh, that said, it's the abuses of those charges when there are things that happen outside of the control of the importer uh, to pick up those containers and, and uh, then return those empties, no appointments uh, in closed areas of yards, not actually available during its free time. Uh, there's many different cases where Demerge and detention charges could be levied, and so it's it's from our point of view. Uh, while we uh, understand, appreciate, and and uh, adopt demerge and detention practices as a way to incentivize, it's that those times when they can't and don't that become the the abuse that we're seeking to correct. Rich, we also discussed, um, you know, in cases like government holds, um, which are more predominant in certain industry verticals than others, um, that there is a certain accepted cost of doing business um, with demerge and related storage charges. Uh, however, that cost of doing business is not necessarily uh, levied directly or should not necessarily be levied directly or wholly on the account of the shipper, um, as all parties involved certainly share that sort of risk of doing business um, terminology. Right. And I think as we, um further develop our comments on the government hold, we will definitely be looking at that. The interpretive rule itself um, left that in sort of a gray area. And I think what you're uh, referring to then is that, uh, you know, there's a commercial aspect to a demerge charge or a detention charge, and there's a punitive aspect to it. And, you know, the, the uh, government holds are done for the greater good of security of the, the commerce. We're all in that together. So security of the United States, and that's why we have these government holds uh, to make sure that all cargo should be is properly declared and is what it says it is, is dangerous to us and all that. Um, and, and so that that risk should actually be spread, not to the necessarily the one that uh, gets tapped for uh, in a government hold, but uh, for, for the good of all. So. Um, you know, but I, I, I understand that, uh, you know, when you have multiple containers, one gets pulled, the others are sitting on terminal, there may be some room there um, that the terminal has a, a, a loss that they should recover from. Uh, but it, should there be a punitive side of that introduced within the penalty? Uh, I, I don't believe so. So that, that's something that we're going to have to vet in our commentary, in our final recommendation. Agreed. Any comments or questions from other committee members? I'd like to comment that the, uh, I think the fees and charges subcommittee, uh, you know, we had our first meeting and, and, and talked about the, uh, you know, some of the, the broad issues, but in a very, 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 very short time, it we kind of drifted out into the root causes of a lot of these charges. And frankly, in many cases, have determined that in some cases the charges are developed by inefficient practices, and in some cases unreasonable practices. Uh, so I, I think that uh, we've got uh, three items on the table now, but I have no doubt that as we continue, that that list is going to grow. I think it most certainly will. I think it's important that we at least, you know, build a foundation um, that we can then further discuss things more related to, you know, demerge attention freight charges specifically. But we have to lay that foundation first, which I think is what we're doing under Rich's leadership right now. Right. Other questions or comments from the committee members? I would also add that uh, we are fully aware of the uh, initiatives going on with OSRA. Uh, they are also uh, involving demerge and detention practices, and we would uh, be uh, careful to be in alignment with all of that as well. Absolutely. Okay, let's open up uh, for questions or comments from uh, members of the public that are joining this call as well. Um, any questions for the members of our Demerge Attention and Freight Charges Subcommittee. Okay. 
Yeah. Rich, seems like they're letting you up easy today too. You and Gabriel uh, buy some lottery tickets today, I think. Uh, just, you know, share it with your other committee members if you win. Um, all right, Dylan, I think the next item on the agenda is a recap and summary of uh, written comments submitted by the public. Yes, that is. Um, and then, so we don't have any um, to report right now, um, but we do encourage members of the public to reach out or send in emails to the NSAC at fmc.gov email box um, regarding sort of the issues that the committees are working on, the subcommittees are working on, and we will make sure that those comments get passed on to uh, the committee and the subcommittees. Um, that's my, yep, that's my little spiel right there. Back to you, Brian. All right, great. Um, Gabriel, do you guys have, uh, maybe you shared it and I missed it, but do you have a calendar for when your next subcommittee meeting is going to be? We don't, but I will circulate that before the end of this week so we can get something going real quick. Okay, yeah. great. Um, Rich, I think our next one is, is it March 17th, is that correct? That is correct, yes. Okay, perfect. And then we are scheduled um, as of now to be attempting to meet in person for the first time in Washington, DC for the full committee meeting in April. Um, I know that we're still working out the logistics, pardon the pun, um, about where that meeting is going to be, uh, where we'll stay and you know what when we'll all sort of come in. I think uh, you know, both in, in formal and informal uh, conversations, we've discussed having subcommittee meetings on that same day, perhaps in the morning with the full committee meeting in the afternoon and just take advantage of all of us being in the same place. Um, I will say it was certainly nice to see a lot of you and meet you uh, for the first time in person at TPM. So, um, you know, again, thank you for coming up and introducing yourself um, to me or, or to Mike. I think Mike's pretty popular though. Mike knows everybody already, um, me not so much. So um, it was good to see you guys and good to be getting out there. Um, if there's uh, additional concerns uh, following this, please just send them to, uh, to myself or to Mike or to Dylan related to that Washington DC in-person meeting. Um, I know that we're still sort of navigating from a corporate standpoint, um, you know, lingering travel restrictions and, and uh, even just personal uh, hesitation to travel. Um, if you do have any concerns that we need to sort of pivot on, let us know, we can do that offline, uh, no issues there. Um, with that, um, I don't really have too many closing remarks other than to give a, a short round of applause uh, to our subcommittees. Um, you guys have put out a lot of good work in a relatively short amount of time. Um, it's difficult sort of navigating uh, this labyrinth of bureaucracy that we found ourselves in uh, sort of in the dark, but Dylan's doing um, as much as he can, I know, to get the information that we've requested um, and, and help us be successful and productive moving forward. Um, I think that, uh, We'll have at least one recommendation ready for the full committee vote by that next committee meeting in, in April, um, assuming we can get beneficial comments from the rest of you um, offline. I think that recommendation draft has been circulated to you guys, um, provided we have those comments and the amendments and, and needed uh, revisions done to that draft. I think we can have a full reading of that at that next meeting. Uh, Rich, is that aligned with what you think as well? I do too. Yeah, I think we're pretty far along on one, and it would be a goal to get a, a couple more out potentially by then. Okay, great. Now, I know that we talked about in, in our subcommittee meeting when box rules did come up, we talked about forming a third subcommittee specifically focused on those box rules. Is that something that we're still interested in doing, Rich? I kicked that out there to the overall committee to see if there's interest in forming that. I think there's enough there and there's enough outside work that's been done on it that uh, may not take a lot of uh, effort, but that uh, we, we certainly want to have uh, a, a, a focus on getting that uh, wrapped up pretty quickly. So I think that could be done better by having a separate committee. I would agree. It's a little bit, I mean, it's related and also unrelated also to the, the demerged detention and, and freight charges um, subcommittee that we already have established. Um, is there any objection to forming a third subcommittee specifically focused on box rules in the short term to sort of work in parallel to the other two subcommittees that we already have? And certainly there's no restriction on you serving on more than one subcommittee at, at any given time, by the way. Any objections to that? Hey, Rich and Brian, uh, can you guys maybe elaborate a little bit on what we would what would entail or what would be covered under the box rule uh, work? Sure. Uh, so box rules, uh, it's, it's, they don't actually exist in a written format anywhere. They're, they're um, sort of an understood way that um, carriers and railroads 
coordinate and cooperate with each other in terms of chassis supply at the inland railheads. And uh, the, the issue comes up that, uh, you know, uh, if you're coming in with one carrier, you can only use one certain type of chassis, even though there may be abundant chassis from a different supplier sitting there, you get knocked out if, if your supply has been depleted. And, and so uh, there's, there's also a, um, inability to bring your own chassis into those railheads you have to use the chassis that's under contract with the carrier so uh, that's the simplified form of box rules um, it's uh, something that's been studied uh, quite a bit in memphis for instance uh, there's other places where it, it, uh, it could be an issue as well and so it's basically for us to uh, to make any recommendations that we might on on how to improve that process if not, or eliminate it, even if, if that's what the recommendation is. Uh, but it's a, you know, a, a long standing uh, practice that results in quite a lot of additional rail storage. To deal. Uh, Bob, do you have another, anything else you wanted to add to that? Well, I, I fully agree that a third committee should be set up to specifically look at the box rules only because of the fact that, as you mentioned, Rich, there's there's, there, when you hear the term box rules, you think that it's probably written down on a piece of paper somewhere or, where you could actually read the rules, but uh, uh, that is not the case. I mean, just real quick, uh, it kind of came into play loosely as a concept uh, when the carriers started to divest themselves of, of chassis. In many cases, uh, when they sold the chassis, they sold them to companies uh, uh, leasing companies and whatever, but part of the deal was that they would uh, utilize those chassis uh, as best as possible. And I think what's happened at the end of the day that that's migrated to a, a scenario where in some cases, particularly at the IPI locations, that it's like a mandate, you must use uh, the designated chassis, so to speak. And that just, just uh, creates a significant volume of inefficiency and an incredible volume of uh, unwarranted uh, storage charges. I, I will say there's a little bit of a razor's edge here that we'll have to walk. I mean, I think that there is some level of, of commercial viability between the carriers and the chassis providers uh, to ensure that there are adequate assets in terms of chassis available to facilitate carrier store moves. I understand that those commercial agreements have been in place. However, to tie this back to kind of what this committee's focus is, the, 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 the charter, so to speak, that the FMC provided for our committee, uh, and I'll read it here, is um, the committee will advise the commission on policies relating to the competitiveness, reliability, integrity, and fairness of the International Ocean Freight Delivery System. Um, the, the key word there is, uh, from my perspective, at least as it relates to box rules, is reliability. Um, you know, for importers that are not using the carrier for uh, a store door delivery and exporters quite candidly as well, who aren't using the carriers for a store door pickup, um, the absence of that reliability to, uh, to, to, to know that there's going to be adequate assets there to facilitate the movement of your cargo uh, currently is not there. Um, we, we don't have that now. Um, you know, in prior years, pre-COVID, even in tight markets, I think in, in most IPI locations, we did. Um, certainly with this demand driven spike that we're seeing on the import side specifically, um, that's deteriorated to, to, to some degree um, and has put our exporters at a, at a uniquely disadvantageous position, I think, in the global marketplace. And so, you know, I think that's the focus of the box rules conversation, um, not necessarily to get in the middle of whatever commercial relationships exist or deals exist between carriers, chassis providers and railheads, but specifically for those shippers uh, who are not using carriers for the store doors, deliveries or pickups, if that makes sense. Well, I think part of the problem is, is that the, the box rules on occasion will preclude the utilization of a chassis that a trucker owns. And that is crazy. I mean, the trucker pulls up, has the wheels ready to roll and take the freight. No, you need to pick up a blue chassis. That is inefficient. Well, but it's also unreliable as well. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Jen, I saw you put a thumbs up there. Were you agreeing or did you have a question? I just agreed with everything you just said in, in regards to how it impacts the exporter. And yeah, Brian, the thing, only thing I was going to add besides reliability is I think optionality, right? Whether it is in a period of high stress or just with, you know, disproportionate demand for a particular provider, 
how does the shipper community have the flexibility to continue to you know, move cargo, right? Uh, and keep supply chain velocity moving at a reasonable pace. And so to your point, it is a, it is a relationship between the ocean carrier, the IEP, their chassis provider, and, and, and their designated rail provider inside of the fact that the ocean carriers are still involved in store door, right? So there's, there is this lack of transparency between a merchant haulage and a carrier haulage container as they come into the intermodal facilities. And so how inside of this can we create greater visibility to where the real need is to have a um, designated chassis under a carrier box versus not, right? And at the same time, to Bob's comment, widening out the opportunity to allow, you know, trucker or uh, shipper assets to come in and support the, the movement of goods. Because again, this, this opportunity challenge that we face in the United States is unique to the United States in this day and age, right? We know how we got here if we've been in this industry for a while, and yet there are ways to make progress um, with, with, with the parties involved that are not putting anybody it's not a zero sum game in this. We have to recognize to your point, the commercial relationships and the operating necessity that brought this into place in the first place and think about ways to find operational flexibility across the country in those wheeled environments where it's still uh, prevalent today. Well, just to close the loop on that, that history lesson as well. I mean, the United States from what I, I mean, all the knowledge that I have from being in the industry as long as I have is the United States was the only market in which carriers actually provided the chassis to begin with. And starting with Maersk in 2010, that started to divest from the chassis provision game, uh, which formed our, our current chassis pools. Um, so this is a unique problem in the United States, but it's one that's kind of on that learning curve or the, the evolutionary curve. It's consequential to, you know, the other unique aspect prior to 2010, where we, we got chassis from carriers. So, I mean, this is a, a, a logical point for the market and the industry to get to. Um, I know that uh, we are not the only group that's evaluating this. I think, Mike, you've been um, uh, part of another Federal Maritime Commission initiative for a number of years and addressing this as well. So we're certainly not the first ones to show up at the party. Um, but to that point, if we can come up with beneficial recommendations representative of both importers and exporters that align and complement what's already been done, um, I think it behooves us to do so. Okay, any uh, additional questions on that? Uh, we can take the subcommittee formation offline. We don't need to do that today, but um, if there's- um... Allison's got her hand up. Uh, yep, sorry, I didn't see that. Hey, uh, no, no problem. And and Mike, I think this, this came up to it when we were talking at TPM, but certainly you mentioned it again, that visibility that both these, these committees on the data and, and really that data focusing on visibility and everything you're talking about in terms of both box rules and detention and emerge, you know, tie into the visibility and data sharing portal. And I think that um, uh, that maybe not necessarily a subcommittee, but that liaison between those two committees and that discussion, because to for anyone trying to make heads or tails of detention and emerge, the data is essential. And I think as we look at Austria, as we look at you know, trying to define what the recommendations can be, it, it, it ties directly to the data. So I just wanted to you know, put that out there. I think we talk about it all the time, but, but um, making sure that there is this liaison between these committees to, to use what we're doing in terms of the, the visibility to complement what we're doing on detention and demerge. So. Just Thanks, Allison. That there's a hundred percent a direct bridge between those two committees as it relates to demerge and data, um, and it's one of the reasons that uh, that Mike and I decided to not serve on the same subcommittee um, to sort of you know have representation with frequent communication on both sides of that uh, both sides of that bridge um, to ensure that you know recommendation from one subcommittee dovetails nicely with what's necessary from the other, um, but. Um, there is a chicken in the egg equation here. I'm not really sure which is going to have to be solved first. I would argue the data needs to probably be solved prior to any sort of you know, fruitful, productive uh, resolution on the demerge side. Uh, although I do think that we will beat you guys on the race of at least one recommendation, it's irrespective of data and demerge per se, but it does, again, set the, the foundation for how we're going to approach demerge in the future. Well, I think inside of both of what you guys have said, you know, Rich also talked about behavior, right? You've got data and you've also got what, what, what behaviors can we get inside of to try to think about this inside of the recommendations. Allison, clearly the bridge needs to be there. And I think to the point, the other point I was going to add is, you know, I know that uh, Commissioner Dye is looking at Port Optimizer with, with LA and trying to see if there's a way to get a clearer picture on activity to get to a more um, clean, visibility on charges, right? And how charges accrue. And so I think 
what you say aligns both with you know bridging the two subcommittees as well as additional work that's going on as long as we you know again are, are working in an aligned fashion i think what you say makes sense because it's it's part of the totality of the system right they're just two different dimensions of it agreed okay we'll uh take the subcommittee formation offline um with that um you know, I think my closing remarks dovetailed into uh, into the the Black Schools conversation there. Um, outside of that, I look forward to meeting all of you guys uh, in April in person. Hopefully, knock on wood, um, we're going to make sure that that happens, uh, and we'll get the logistics details shared with you uh, in short order. Uh, Mike, any closing remarks from you? Just again, I guess for those participating today outside the committee, just to reinforce again um, to reach out to the committee to provide guidance and perspective. I conveyed the same thing to people I met with at the TPM conference last week. You know, we've got a broad cross section of national shippers here represented uh, to serve. And yet we are part of a broader system and we need to hear from ge different geographies and different industries and different size organizations to ensure that we're, we've got real, we're taking everybody's needs into account and having, once recommendations come out, they're aligned and reflective of the broader needs that you're experiencing inside the system. So again, um, my hope is for the April meeting, uh, Dylan or, has actually got some comments to read. Um, but again, not because we wanna convey it in the public meeting, we wanna help additional perspective and form formulation of policy recommendations. And so hearing from you is important as we go forward through this process. It's also important that the recommendations are inclusive and representative of everybody's perspective, even though it's not represented here personally on the committee. So thanks, Mike, for that. Dylan, can you share that uh, email address again, just one more time uh, for the public comments to, to be sent to? Yeah, so as these uh, recommendations get going, um, some of the, when we announce future meetings, sort of recommendations will be um, publicized then. Um, and comments, we are gonna ask that you please email nsac at fmc.gov um, to comment on sort of the committee's work. Um, and we will sort of report those out at future meetings and I'll share it with the committee as well. Thanks, Dylan. So. Okay, great. I think that rounds out the agenda today. Um, appreciate everybody joining. Um, happy that we got done early, although it did fly by relatively fast. If there are any questions, please use the email address that Dylan shared, share your questions there and we'll respond in, in, in very short order as well. Um, so with that, look forward to seeing all of you again um, in about a month's time. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.